Coming up on Talking Points, President Joe Biden is coming to Syracuse this week and bringing billions of dollars with him. What he'll say in CNY on Thursday. Plus, his opponent, Donald Trump, back in court today, how his defense attorney plans to keep him out of prison. And Congress coming together to support allies overseas, but could it cost the House Speaker his job? All of that and so much more when Talking Points starts right now. Good evening and welcome into Talking Points. I'm Erica Love. And I'm Olivia Maniscalco. Thank you so much for joining us on a jam-packed news night. Let's start right here in central New York, where the leader of the free world will be here in just three days. That's right. The White House says President Joe Biden will travel to Syracuse on Thursday. He's expected to announce that billions of dollars will be heading towards the Micron Project. It's all thanks to the Chips and Loss and Science Law Biden signed to help bring microchip manufacturing back to American soil. Joining us now is our Luke Welch. Luke, where are you right now and what's the latest on the Biden visit? Well, Eric and Olivia, it looks like I'm on a common street in the suburbs of Syracuse, but I'm actually at 610 Stinnern Avenue, which is a, has a lot of history here in the central New York region. This is the home where President Biden himself stayed when he attended the SU College of Law from the mid to late 60s. Now, while he was attending SU, he found a former classmate, Nalia Hunter, who would become his eventual wife here in Syracuse. And they would, then that's when he would head to Delaware to start becoming a public defender and then his first U.S. Senator bid now, the SU grad, the former Delaware Senator, and now the sitting president is planning to make his way back to where his roots are here in the Salt City. The White House press releasing a statement earlier today saying, talking about how he plans to make his way here on Thursday, April 25th, to discuss how this investment from the Chips and Science Acts is going to help grow the economy here in central New York and invest in families and workers and voters all across the, our region. Now, this $6.1 billion dollar grant that it was awarded to Micron and to use in central New York is just a small percent of the hundred billion dollars the planned budget for the facility in Clay. Now some local lawmakers have been calling this out specifically Republicans like Brandon Williams who have been saying that this investment or excuse me that this visit was at a poor time due to the loss of two police officers that is still strong in the minds and hearts of police workers, first responders, and even community members here in the region. Now, this visit would obviously take a lot of police force to execute to ensure the safety of President Biden as well as residents here in Clay. But some, that's why some local lawmakers have been calling it out for. Um, I have, we'll have more details about when exactly the president will be visiting in terms of time of day on Thursday here on Citrus TV News. But for now, Olivia and Erica, I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Luke Welch, thank you. While President Biden is getting out on the campaign trail, his opponent, Donald Trump, is stuck in a Manhattan courtroom today. Opening statements began in his hush money trial brought by the DA, Alvin Bragg. Now let's turn to Ben Bassick, who's following the case for us tonight. Ben, what are prosecutors arguing and how have Trump's attorneys responded? This morning, opening arguments painted a fine line between election interference and illegal fraud. The word of the day for Team Trump, witch hunt. The presumptive GOP nominee pled not guilty to 34 felony counts of falsifying business records relating to the payout of adult film actress Stormy Daniels through longtime fixer Michael Cohen. Trump's legal team insists Cohen was paid as Trump's personal lawyer, not as reimbursement. They prepped the jury to hear about affairs and hush money, but say this is a really boring paper crime that Trump had no involvement in. His team is campaigning off these courts appearances, writing an email to his supporters. This is a Biden trial. It is a full frontal assault on American democracy in service of the interests of failed president crooked Joe Biden's campaign. But the prosecution soldiers on calling its first witness David Pecker, the former National Enquirer publisher accused of collaborating with Trump and Cohen in catch and kill schemes aimed to influence the 2016 election. Pecker admitted to frequently paying sources, telling the court the only thing that was important was the cover of a magazine. Speaking of magazine covers, New York Magazine profiled Trump attorney Todd Blanche and previewed his strategy at trial to turn just one juror into the former president's favor. 
He made his first effort today during opening arguments, telling the jurors, I have a spoiler alert. There's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. Tomorrow, Pecker's testimony will continue. It will be up to 12 New Yorkers to decide if Trump will be the first former president convicted of a felony. Erica and Olivia, back to you. Ben, thank you. From one Trump court case to another, the Supreme Court is set to hear his presidential immunity argument later this week. He faces four felony counts in the election's interference case brought by special counsel Jack Smith. The charges relate to Trump's actions on and leading up to the Capitol riot. In a social media post about the case, Trump says, quote, without complete immunity, a president of the United States would not be able to properly function. One of the interesting dynamics in this case is that Trump appointed a third of the justices on the Supreme Court, Erica. I just think it's very interesting because we're trying to figure out, you know, does this actually make a difference? A third is a big portion. There's only nine of them. But when it comes down to this, does it really matter? These judges haven't had to vote on whether a president will be able to run in an election before. I know it's really a, a case we've never seen before, especially because the timing of when they make this decision is really going to impact the election. Because if they decide that he does have immunity, then some of the other trials that Trump is going through are going to look a lot different. And it's also the fact that, you know, this is for felony trials charges, right? We're not sitting here. We're not talking about Nixon. This isn't, you know, JFK, but it's definitely one of those things that we're going to have to pay attention to. Yes, exactly. Well, we will continue to cover the Supreme Court's decision on that. When we return, though, classes canceled at Columbia as protesters occupy the campus. What the school's president said to Congress right after the break. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? <laughs> B, console her. Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Thank you. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. Shafiq, the president of Columbia University, testifying before Congress last week. But over the weekend, demonstrations continued to escalate to the point where today all in-person classes were canceled due to safety concerns. The White House has condemned the chaos on campus. And Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman tweeted that he believes the protests are, quote, anti-Semitic, unconscionable, and dangerous. Add some tiki torches in Charlottesville for these Jewish students. To President Shafiq, he added, do your job or resign so Columbia can find someone who will. And late Thursday, Israel fired three missiles into Iran. Reports indicate the United States was notified by Israel in advance of the strike. But here's what the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, had to say the morning after. The reports that uh, you've seen, um, I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions. And at our map tonight for us is Peter Barry. Peter, where did the Israeli strike take place? This is a map of the region. As you can see, Israel is to your left and Iran is to your right. But it happened in the Isfahan city. It took place 
to around 200 miles from the capital of Tehran. But let's take a look at the timeline here. Here's what it led up to, to the latest strike. On April 1st, oh, my bad, Israel bombed an Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, killing several members of their military. So Iran responded by sending hundreds of drones and missile strikes towards Israel, the first time they've directly attacked the country that unprecedentedly move led to Israel's strike last week in Isfahan. And Peter, this was a response by Israel to an unprecedented attack by Iran later um, earlier this month. What did that exactly entail? So let's take a look at how the campaign played out by the numbers. There was 120 plus ballistic missiles, 170 drones, and it lasted around five hours according to a spokesperson for the Israeli military. Erica and Olivia, I'm gonna send it back to you guys. Peter, thank you. Thank you. As fighting continues in the Middle East and in Ukraine, Congress is sending help to our allies after months of gridlock. Our Ronnie Palo reports from the nation's capital. This is rocking the House once again. On this vote, the A's are 311 and the nays are 112. The bill is passed. Oh. One voting present. I missed it, but thank you. Okay. The House voting to send $95 billion in aid overseas with funding for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. The package also includes another push to ban TikTok, ordering the app to divest from its Chinese parent company. The new funding will provide Ukraine and Israel with critical weapons as the nations continue to fight their wars. But passage in the Republican Party was anything but smooth. You know, I, I can make a selfish decision and, and, and do something that, um, th that that's different, but I... I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. Um, I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. I really do. Speaker Johnson now has to stare down the same barrel as his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy. As soon as the bills passed in the House, the calls for him to resign from within his own party began almost instantly. That he's the Democrat Speaker of the House, not the Republican elected Speaker. But Johnson and former President Trump are holding strong on the passage of aid while progressive Democrats on the other side were angered the U.S. gave more money to Israel. The package heads to the Senate tomorrow. It's expected to pass there and then head down the street to the White House. On Capitol Hill in Washington, I'm Ronnie Perillo. Ronnie, thank you. Joining us now to discuss the threats Mike Johnson is facing to his speakership from the most conservative members of his conference is Talking Points analyst Noah Gutfleisch, who is making his final appearance on the show tonight. Noah, happy to have you here. Why is Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, taking this effort to oust Johnson? Well, it all stems from last month when the minibus uh, spending bill, which funded the government, that passed uh, with bipartisan support, and many of the more right-wing members of the GOP caucus were upset with that, notably Green. Uh, so she filed a motion to vacate. It still has not uh, been taken up. But in the meantime, uh, three foreign aid bills to Taiwan, Ukraine, and Israel have passed, and some of the uh, more non-interventionist members of the GOP caucus have, have been angry, notably uh, Paul Gosar and uh, Thomas Massey. So uh, that's how it's getting some support from the more conservative wing of the caucus. Yeah, and Noah, last time when Kevin McCarthy faced similar threats, the Democrats said they wouldn't back him, and they didn't. And what happened next was he was kicked out of his seat. So do you think that the Democrats will come to the rescue for Mike Johnson? Uh, well, uh, the foreign aid bills did pass, which a lot of Democrats wanted. So I think that could be a big reason as to why some would support him. In fact, actually, uh, two congressmen have said that they would, Jared Moskowitz and uh, Ro Khanna. And also some have also indicated support that they would if the bills passed. Notably, uh, my representative, Tom Swazi, uh, he said that uh, he would support, that he would not support an ousting of uh, Johnson if it came to the floor. So it seems that, and it seems that this is the reason because of the foreign aid bills coming to the floor. So it seems that there are some supporters. However, the House Democrat Caucus leaders, uh, Jeffries and uh, Clark have not, endorsed a motion to vacate or to vacate. No, Gutfleisch, thank you. And 
We will still have more to come on Carrie Lake as she says she doesn't support Arizona's near total abortion ban. But has she always felt this way? Her flip flop and more are on the way. Stay with us. Yo, camping buddy. Okay, you guys ready? Dude, I thought you were driving. I thought you were driving. Oh, I never said I was driving. I, I definitely can't drive. <laughs> if you're high, just don't drive. It's illegal everywhere. If you feel different, you drive different. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers, but you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. what his whole campaign has been about. A, a person, a county executive, who has connected with the people. And Mr. Kinney, how are you tonight? Good, how are you? I'm Eric, I'm here with Citrus News. I'm wondering, how are you feeling tonight so far? I'm feeling good. Yeah? Feeling good, yeah. Hello, Erica. It was very nice to meet you last fall. I hear you're graduating. So I'd like to just wish you all the best and hope and pray that you have a great career and a wonderful life. Take care. Welcome back. That was such a fun moment from our election special last year. We talk a lot on talking points about elections here in the U.S. and concerns about our democracy. Yeah, that's right. But it doesn't just happen here. Elections are underway in India. Our Megan Acker is here to break it all down for us. Hey, Megan. Erica and Olivia, the biggest election in the world is happening right now. On Friday, voters started heading to the polls in India to decide who will lead the most populous country on the globe. By the numbers, there are 969 million eligible voters expected to participate in this election. The process will last six weeks, meaning we won't have results until June 4th. This is partly to ensure that everybody has access to a polling site, which has been a major priority of the Indian government. They've encouraged the use of electronic voting machines and promise that all voters will have access to a polling place 1.24 miles from their home. Now, that's caused some problems when trying to reach the many rural areas of the country, but they've done it, investing heavily in voting infrastructure. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is running for re-election for a third consecutive term, matching the record set by India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. The election process there is a little bit different from what we're used to here in the U.S. Instead of an electoral college, Voters choose the representatives in the lower house of the, of the lower pa parliament, called the Lob Saka. This year, all but two of the three, 545 seats are up for grabs. That means that to win a simple majority, Modi's party, the BJP, must win 272 seats. Then they get to pick him as prime minister again. Modi's far-right party has had growing success in recent years. Take a look at all of this orange here. That's representing the BJP party, um, the blue in the opposition, that is the INC here, and that has held the majority for most of India's democratic history, apart from recent years. 
Supporters say that Modi's growing popularity in the popularity of his party is because of the economic successes the country has experienced under his leadership. Critics say it might also be because of his growing embrace of the controversial Hindutva ideology. Modi's party has roots with the RSS, a paramilitary group that has been dedicated to the Hindu nationalism movement since 1925. Hindutva has been accused of stifling the rights of religious minorities in the country in an attempt to create an ethnostate. Modi has also maintained a strong relationship with Donald Trump, with some drawing comparisons between the two politicians. Here's what Trump had to say about Modi when they met in 2017. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have Prime Minister Modi of India, who has been such a great Prime Minister. I've been speaking with him and reading about you, and you have done a great job uh, economically. India is doing very well, and in so many other ways. Some high praise from the former president. Now, Modi's opponent, Rahul Gandhi, has been campaigning hard, but experts expect that once the results come in, Modi will be re-elected for a third term. That's all I have for now. Eric and Olivia, back over to you. Megan, thank you. Now back to U.S. soil, the latest in Arizona. Republicans in the state legislature blocked a vote to repeal a near-total abortion ban revived by the state Supreme Court last week. Both parties agree it could have a big impact on the close elections there for the president and Senate. The Republican candidate, Carrie Lake, for Senate in that state, put out a video message on her abortion views. I chose life, but I'm not every woman. I want to make sure that every woman who finds herself pregnant has more choices so that she can make that choice that I made. This total ban on abortion that the Arizona Supreme Court just ruled on is out of line with where the people of this state are. How she's felt about this issue here to discuss more is Talking Points analyst Andrea Rose Oates. Andy, is Lake being consistent here? Well, we know that Carrie Lake does have, like you referred, Erica, a flip-flop decision-making process when it comes to the stance of abortion. She was referred to calling the 1864 abortion ban a great law a few years ago and now has a completely different stance. So it not only concerns citizens of Arizona, especially women, to see what the future of, you know, childbearing is, but also what is it going to look like for other instances of policymaking that she does outside of just abortion. And how has uh, the former President Trump's influence shown up in her campaign? Well, interestingly enough, Olivia, she does refer to herself as the female Donald Trump in heels. So it definitely makes people think, number one, why are you even calling yourself that? And number two, how is this influencing you in other areas as well? So we look at her policymaking and we see that she kind of has the same agenda as former President Trump did as well, in the sense that she has the same issues on abortion, education, finance, and and as other issues as well. So it definitely, you know, concerns not only the Arizona citizens as well, but also people who are looking to vote for her in the race for Arizona Senate. Yep, and I want you to look at this map of all the states that could have an abortion-related measure on their ballot in November, including right here in New York and down in Florida. Florida used to be the closest of all swing states, but has leaned more to the right in recent years. So, Andy, could a measure like this swing things back for Democrats? How have these kinds of efforts worked in the past? Well, I think any way that we look at abortion, Livia, it's definitely going to be a major stance, especially coming up in the presidential election. So I think that when citizens are thinking for a candidate that they want to represent them in their beliefs, they need to think of someone, especially who believes in what they believe in when it comes to abortion rights, especially, I believe, if you're a woman or a mother during this time as well, it's going to be very important for our future candidates for government. Andrea Rose Oates, thank you. Let's talk about one more story from the campaign trail before we go to break. President Biden was on the stump in Pittsburgh last week and was drawing a sharp contrast with Trump on military issues. Biden condemned Trump's reported comments on troops being, quote, suckers and losers, but also had an interesting anecdote to share. My uncle, they called him Ambrose Bozzi, they called him Bozzi, my uncle Bozzi. He got shot down in... New Guinea, and uh, they never found the body because there used to be there were a lot of cannibals for real in that part of New Guinea. 
Now, according to U.S. government records, there is no indication Biden's uncle was shot down or eaten by cannibals. And experts told PolitiFact the story is highly unlikely. It is just the latest in a string of personal anecdotes Biden has told throughout his career that turned out to be false. In 1988, when Biden first ran for president, he claimed that he graduated in the top half of his law class here in Syracuse. In reality, out of 85 students, he finished 76th. To be clear, Biden is not alone in this. Politicians twist or embellish personal stories all the time, regardless of their party, some more than others. Does George Santos ring a bell? But as voters express concerns about the president's age and memory, moments like this one might not help him win over those who are still undecided. Well, when we come back, Erica and I will say goodbye to Talking Points. We're back in 30 seconds doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Pre-diabetes does. One in three adults has pre-diabetes, but with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute pre-diabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. In making her Talking Points debut is Talking Points analyst Erica Love. Olivia, let's start with you first. Who is Amy Coney Barrett and what is her background? Well, Amy Coney Barrett has been confirmed as a conservative justice, which means that there is now a six to three conservative majority in the court. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Welcome back. Welcome back. Those are some of our first moments on Talking Points. And this will be our last. We'll be graduating next month. Joining us now to send us off, our former Talking Points analyst, Mariah Humiston and T. Gordon Brown. <laughs> Hi, guys. Oh, hello. oh, my gosh. How are you feeling? I mean, I know how we're feeling. <laughs> yeah. This is so crazy. This is crazy. We miss you guys. T. we'll start with you. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> great. Hi, guys. I miss you. Oh, oh. Hi, miss you so much. Um, I am so, so unbelievably proud of both of you. It's crazy to see you guys here as seniors. The fact that you're graduating, I genuinely cannot get over it. I'm so proud of you both. Watching you grow has been literally such a pleasure. You guys are wonderful. Wow, Tegan, thank you. We, it feels like you were just here, which is it feels why like you were just here. Even more crazy that this is our last talking Well, it even ever. feels crazy because Mariah feels yeah. like she was just here. Like yeah. I was just sitting in food.com with her. Exactly. Yeah. It's been two years. Yeah, no, it's been two years. Um, it's so great to see you guys again. I'm so happy to, you know, be back and get to wish you guys goodbye. Um, I think the two of you have shown incredible leadership and growth. Uh, I saw it when I was at Citrus. I've seen it now that I'm no longer at Citrus and I'm in the industry. Uh, you guys have the curiosity and talent that is going to make your career so exciting, um, but you also have the kindness and the grace that you have always carried yourselves with that make you guys great people. Um, your entire senior group, I mean, you two are phenomenal women leaders. I look up to you. I know so many other people and specifically women at Citrus look up to you, but your entire senior group has brought something so extraordinary to Citrus TV and you all have left it much better than how you found it when most of you came in during COVID. Um, so I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so lucky I get to be part of your goodbye uh, and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I think just Oh, sorry. I think just the, the passion that you guys have showed, you know, throughout your entire time here, the dedication that you put into this show every single week. I know it's stressful sometimes. I know those election specials, those long nights, everything that you guys have just put into this has been so phenomenal. I'm just so proud of you both. So much. I mean, while we're here, I definitely want to give thanks to those yeah. who came before us. Erin yeah. uh, Lyons, oh. Oscar Offerman, Mariah, obviously Tegan. And thank you to our uh, co-anchors, yeah. um, Chilakasi Adele and Ben Schiller and Jake Morrell. Yeah. It has been an amazing experience working with the entire team here. And I know yeah. I speak for the both of us. Um, that's yeah. all the time we I, have. I mean, I've truly just learned so much from you, from everyone who's came before us. I just feel 
I just feel so lucky to have been able to learn so much and really grow here at Citrus, and especially on Talking Point. <laughs> That's all the time we do have tonight. Please be sure to follow us on social media to see what we do next, along with our Citrus TV news for the latest here on campus. Talking Points and this amazing team will return in September. We can't wait to see what they do next. I'm Olivia Maniscalco. And I'm Erica Love. Enjoy your summer, and thank you for tuning in with us, Syracuse.